Good morning. I don't know about you, but I love an underdog. I always cheer for the little guy, the one that people count out. Growing up, our family always chose the smallest dog in the litter or the funny looking shelter pup that sat shyly in the corner. There's something innate within us that we want to root for an underdog. Growing up pre-cable days, we had a black and white TV and we only had seven channels. There weren't many great kids shows to watch. It was a blessing though, as it forced us to read more. It asked us to use our imagination. I love the story of David and Goliath. I credit it with instilling within me the underdog spirit. As a boy, I was in awe thinking about the young shepherd boy confronting a terrible giant. I loved imagining the young boy carrying a sling in five smooth stones to square off against a hulking monster. Maybe I was strange, but as a kid, I used to imagine myself as David. And much to my mother's dismay, I would shoot rocks at trees and flower pots with my slingshot. Summer trips to the beach were great, but they also took on a special quest and a requirement that I leave with five smooth stones in my pocket. Today my car is filled with smooth stones even though I no longer actively play with slingshots. I can't break old habits. There's something comforting in the feel of a stone that has been smoothed by water. In 1982, I was in second grade. I had recently moved to Belmont and I had started in a new school. Miss Foss was my elementary school teacher and I loved her. She was inspirational and she always read out loud to us. Her stories were filled with underdogs. Charlie from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Wilbur from Charlotte's Web, and Stuart from Stuart Little. Halloween of 1982 was a great time. It happened to fall on one of those days and nights of Indian summer. It was a Halloween that would not require a winter coat to be worn over one's costume. I was thrilled because I finally got to wear a store-bought costume, not something lame made by my mother. Without a jacket, I could totally rock my store-bought costume. So the costume was far better in theory, though, than in practice. The hard plastic mask had razor-sharp eye holes. and It had the cheapest elastic band that always broke the instant that you put it on your face. I didn't care. I was wearing a fly E.T. costume. Yes, my life looked much like a scene from Netflix Stranger Things, another great series filled with many underdogs. And I was a total dork, and I didn't care. E.T. and his friend Elliot were true underdogs, and Spielberg's movie remains one of my favorites. It's a true masterpiece. It's a must-watch. So I remember the Halloween so well because on the day before, on October 30th, we had a great family day. That was one of those magical days when the Folin family loaded up our Ford Country Squire, yes, the one with wood panel siding, and we drove to Boston College in Alumni Stadium. My dad had gone to Penn State and my mom, BC, and on that day in 1982, BC was playing Penn State. It was a sold out game and there was great excitement. Doug Flutie, a local QB hero from Natick, was set to face off against the QB great Todd Blackledge in the highly regarded Penn State team, a team that would eventually win the national championship that year. In our home, we were only allowed to root for two teams, BC or Penn State. And this was a unique position to be in. Both parents wanted me to root for their college on that day. I had to choose. And it wasn't hard because everyone loved Doug Flutie. And he was small, five feet, nine inches. And he played with reckless abandonment. He played like we did in the park, scrambling around and throwing the ball with guts. A true underdog. Flutie won games, and he was fun to watch. 
I was all in for BC and Flutie's magic that day. I remember Doug walking onto the field and the crowd erupting. And he looked so small leaving that huddle. You could barely see him among the linemen. And Flutie played with passion. On the first drive, he threw an 18-yard touchdown pass to tight end Scott Nizolik. And BC led 7 to nothing, and the crowd went nuts. It was electric. BC was going to take down that giant Penn State. And everything was going as planned. And this was the biggest game at Boston College in 40 years. Then things started to change. And the best laid plan failed. Penn State tailback Kurt Warner ran for 183 yards and scored three touchdowns. Quarterback Todd Blackledge completed 14 of 27 passes for 243 yards and threw three touchdowns. But Doug Flutie poured his heart into the game throwing for a school record 520 yards in a 52-17 to 17 loss. Joe Paterno, the Penn State coach, called Flutie a one-man offense. And I learned a lesson that day. Sometimes the underdog doesn't win. Sometimes we walk onto the battlefield and we don't succeed. In my night life, I know for certain I've learned more from a loss then I have a win. Losing has taught me to reflect, to renew, to review, and to adapt. Failure can teach us a lot if we let it. Losing has also forced me to make changes and to take a hard look in the mirror. I have found true growth in those moments. Failure is an important part of your life. That game was a tough loss for Flutie, but he didn't quit. He recommitted. In 1983, he finished third in the Heisman Trophy ballot, and the following year, he won it. In 1984, Doug Flutie made the greatest pass in the history of college football, the Hail Mary pass to defeat the number one ranked Miami on a Thanksgiving weekend. Caught by Boston College. I don't believe it. A moment that I will never forget, and one that changed the future of Boston College. Success never comes easy for the underdog. We must remember that. Success requires that we work hard to achieve our goals. It requires that we outwork those who are more gifted, bigger, stronger, faster, or smarter. We can and should all identify with the underdog because we all, in some way, shape, and form, an underdog. Success has never come easy for me in my life. It's required that I work at it each and every day. And as we begin the second half of the year, I challenge you to work hard. I challenge you to embrace an underdog mentality. I challenge you to put in an extra effort to go that extra mile. It matters. Frankly, it's worth it. We must remember that David had faith in God and that faith led him into the battlefield. His faith gave him courage and confidence. I have faith in you and I have faith in this community. You need to have faith in yourself and in God. While it took David only one rock and one shot from that sling to slay that giant, I want to remind you, he did take five stones with him, just in case. Remember that we all face setbacks that require us to work harder and to recommit. We're the smallest school in the Catholic Conference, and this requires that we all work together that we all pitch in. CM needs each of you to strive for excellence, to join multiple athletic teams, to participate in clubs, to act on the stage, to sing in the play. It requires that you study each night, and it requires that we all put forth our best effort. Success does not just happen. It requires collective effort. As you begin this new year, I'm not asking you to make a short-lived New Year's resolution. Those never work. I ask you to reflect upon your life and ask you to prioritize five qualities or virtues this year. With God's help in 2023, I strive to have more patience, compassion, introspection, self-control, 
encourage. We all can prioritize the right virtues in our life. I have no doubt that we can each overcome challenges that await us in this upcoming year. Trust in yourself, trust in the slow work of God, and remember to live Jesus in our hearts. Thank you very much. Let's have a great year.